have your Bible, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 30. And uh, it is our honor to host No Limits 2020. I hope you leave here with a vision that God gives you a picture of what can be, what should be, and leave here that it must be. Leave here with a made up mind that you're going to see it come to pass. How many have been praying for revival in your church? Let me see your hand. Now we're going to go do something about it. We're going to do something about it. And we're, we're kind of like Southwest West Airlines. We know there are conference options, but we are delighted that you chose to fly with us this week. And hopefully you got something a little better than stale pretzels and peanuts. Hopefully you left with some meat on your bones. Blessed by the power of the Holy Ghost. Have you been blessed already by being here? And uh, I know we live busy lives, and there's a conference somewhere every week. And uh, I hope it's our prayer that No Limits is a strength and a help to you. And uh, I, I hope you're here. Can, can I just be honest? I hope you're here not out of some imaginary friendship duty. I grew up with this. I know how it works. There, there's this obligation we have sometimes. We feel like that if I don't go, they're not going to love me anymore. If we have reduced friendship to whose conference we attend, we have sunk pretty low on the love chart. And I know we can't get to everything, but you came and you're here, and I pray that God would strengthen you, and I pray that this is not for you an unnecessary meeting. I pray that you're not just here out of some kind of duty. But I hope you came tonight uh, and this week to receive something from the Lord. And if you didn't, you have received something. Because last night, what a word we heard from Brother Smith and today Bishop Young and Pastor Adams. Have you been blessed in Jesus' name? Amen. Amen. I give honor to all of the men and women of God and saints of God and the men and women that work hard to make the kingdom go forward, working jobs and entrepreneurs. I know preachers get all the credit a lot of time, but none of us would be doing anything if it wasn't for anointed saints of God. I think we ought to give all the saints of God a big hand right now. Come on, clap like you're thankful for the house of God and the people of God, the saints of God. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verse number 1. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and had smitten Ziklag, Ziklag and burned it with fire. And had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire. Their wives, their sons, their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. David's wives were taken. Skip down to verse 6. And David was greatly distressed. Everybody say, greatly distressed. For the people spake of stoning him. Because the soul of all the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and for his daughters. I find it interesting. They, uh, they weren't grieving for their wives, evidently. <laughs> Just thought I'd slide that in there. But David encouraged himself in the Lord. Somebody didn't hear that. David encouraged himself. Look at your neighbor and say, you got to encourage yourself. Amen. Last night, there were hands raised in the beginning of our time of fellowship that the last year has been a year of adversity. And tonight, I'm, I'm going to minister, hopefully, uh, and I'm just going to be honest with you. I didn't bring a conference message tonight. I, I'm not coming with some global initiative. I'm not here to launch some grand leadership strategy. 
or some radical new approach to face and changing world. And I didn't bring a holiness or hell message tonight. I came with one purpose in mind, to lift your faith and to encourage somebody. I don't know what you've been through, but I felt the Holy Ghost talk to me and say somebody needs their faith increased and somebody needs to be encouraged in the Holy Ghost. Amen. So I, 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 I've, I know how conferences are. They're going to pick apart people. on. They tune in just to see if they can find something to pick you apart on. You preach about taking authority, and they say you're in the dominion theology. You preach about holiness, they say you're too strict. You preach about love, they say you're too liberal. So to all of the haters and detractors, just whatever you're going to say, get after it. But in this house, we're going to be encouraged in the Holy Ghost. I want you to act like it's Sunday night at your church and there's a soul that's got a need and there's a heart that's hurting and we're going to leave here full of faith. We're going to leave here full of power, believing God to transform our situation. So we started with an unexpected miracle call. And then this morning we found out it's supper time. It's time to fill the house. And then we heard the way to take dominion is take one step at a time. Look at somebody and say, you got to do something. But when you leave here, for every new level, there is a new devil. And I want to preach tonight surviving the setback surviving the setback clap your hands one more time and shout for the victory you're going to take advantage of tonight hallelujah you may be seated tell somebody you can survive the setback Man, I looked around this room today and I got a friend here that the devil tried to take out with cancer, but he's healed here in Victory. Tim, it's good to see you healed, clothed, and in your right mind. Hallelujah. I came to tell somebody cancer ain't got nothing on Jesus. The devil's a liar and the father of lies, he's still a healer. Amen. Amen. The setting of our text begins about 14 months prior. David had fled. You know the story well from Saul. He had been spending a lot of time running. And uh, in his trying to survive, he wound up connected with the Philistines at Gath. And a whole lot of preaching is done there. And, but specifically, he had uh, connected with Achish. Achish had evidently a heart uh, of some type of compassion and had taken David in and David's family. And uh, there was a place that was available. And so Achish, kind of like a rental home, he had given a city to David and his family and his army, the city of Ziklag, to be his base. David moved his family there and uh, set up camp and left them there. It was kind of a secure place. And evidently word got to King Saul that David was now uh, pretty deep in enemy territory and was protected by Achish and was at Ziklag. And evidently that was enough for Saul to say, well, he's out of sight, he's out of mind, we'll leave him there. And so uh, David and his family had peace. David was perceived... Uh, to be uh, working for Achish, but David was a sneaky little fella, and you, you study the Word of God. He he wasn't fighting at all for Achish. He was he was out like a nomad with his army. He was secretly fighting the Amalekites and destroying all the evidence. And all of the rumor was that David was fighting for the Philistines. 
This continued for about 14 months. And for David, it was a kind of an undercover operation. And it was a good run for about 14 months. And then things got a little complicated. Because Israel and Philistia had not signed any covenants or contracts or peace agreements. And, and uh, so Achish and his army gathered against Israel at Aphek. And uh, now David is in a difficult, complicated situation. He can't do his undercover operations, uh, uh, marauding the Amalekites and destroying the evidence. He's now called to the battle at Aphek, but evidently Achish was somewhat naive, more than his rulers in his military. The Philistine army, even though Achish wanted David to fight, the Philistines being a little more savvy, they didn't trust David and they didn't trust his men. And uh, they approached Achish and Achish agreed and decided that, you know, David, this is not going to be a good thing for you and not going to be a good thing for me. So why don't you take a few days and go back to Ziklag and visit your family. You've been here for a number of months fighting. And so uh, David and his men, uh, they begin the journey. It's a three-day journey. And they travel back. And this is where we join the narrative in our text. They arrive on their third day of the journey. David and his band of warriors arrive and discover to their chagrin and pain that in their absence, I don't know how many weeks or months it had been since they had been to Ziklag, but somewhere recently their enemy, the Amalekites, had come in in David's absence and had ravaged and pillaged the city. Human tendency is to assume the worst. And no doubt, uh, David and his men could only imagine what had happened to their families. They are overwhelmed by the situation. They are gripped with intense sorrow and sadness. The Bible says that they cried and wept to the point that they were physically unable to cry anymore. Their sadness and grief then moved to terror or fear. And then it moved, as warriors often do, their fear turned to anger. Now, I know we, we, we put these characters in Bible language, in Bible story land, and uh, we kind of forget that these are real human beings. Imagine with me if you came home from work and your entire subdivision was gone. And your house was smoldering. And your family was gone. And every house was gone. And it's a time of war. You can only imagine. These are real people even though it's another time and a, another place. <clears throat> but they are just like us. What would be going through your mind? The response to the trauma. Everybody say trauma. Shock. Sadness, fear. Then it moves to anger mixed with confusion. And confusion has a way of paralyzing us after severe setbacks. And in their confusion, they became angry at themselves for losing their own family while they're out fighting a battle. But the reality is, is you can only survive so long beating yourself up. And it won't be very long until you'll begin to look for somebody to blame instead of yourself. Because that's our nature. We look for somebody or something to blame for what we feel. Another dynamic that often takes place there is we turn to people in our pain Sometimes the very last people we should turn to. And we listen to advice that may be the very last thing we need to hear. Now, I'm not a counselor. I'm not a therapist. I don't claim to be. I don't have all of the mental health issues down. and I, I don't know all of the things about counseling and therapy. But I know that these people 
were deeply disappointed. They were dispirited. And now it moved to the feeling that they had been mistreated and they moved to victimization. So when you become a victim in your own mind and you're looking for somebody to blame, they turn to sympathetic friends who were also feeling the same way and they begin to reinforce their victimization. And so suddenly they figured out it's the leadership's fault. Mm. Man, I feel a preacher getting on me right now. People love to find fault with leadership. Boy, I can hear him. He can't get along with anybody. He can't get along with Saul. Saul was a good king. David showed up, got all arrogant, cutting off that Goliath's head. Now he can't get along with, I mean, he provided for him. Couldn't get along with Achish. We had that worked out. He couldn't get along with him. Now we're out here. and I mean, he just has a history of trouble. I mean, they're, they're going down the list of everything that's wrong with David. And now we've lost our family because of him. And his very own army turned on him. Isn't that the way it is sometimes? At the very point where you need support the most, people that should be standing with you turn against you. I thought some of y'all had been through some adversity in the last year. I thought there was people here that knew what it felt like to be pain and adversity and opposition come against you. Now, I, I want to leave them right there for a minute. I, I want us to think about David. I, I'm going to preach in a minute. As I read this story, it becomes pretty clear that their response and David's response are radically different. Consider, if you will, with me that discontented, upset, arguing, blaming, victimhood army has the very same story as David. They're facing the same story the same issues over the same event, the very same trauma, the very same setback, but a radically different response. Have you ever noticed that some people just have a way of getting through? I, I, I pastor, I told you I'm gonna be a pastor tonight, it's Sunday night. I pastor people that can go through hell itself. But I know this time next month, they're going to still be right there living for God. But I got people in the church, if you unfollow them on Instagram, they backslide. Or if their five-year-old kid don't get invited to the five-year-old kid's birthday party, they turn on the pastor as if it's the pastor's fault. I've noticed that some people can take hell right in the face and like Timex, take a licking, but keep on ticking. David had experienced the same war trauma. He had experienced the same failure. He now had the same survivor's guilt that everybody else had. Don't overlook the human dimension of this. These are real people with real issues, with real trauma. But I want you to look, David, a little. I, I know he's giant killer. We know he's King David. We know he's anointed psalmist. We know he's man after God's own heart. That's the rave card. That's the IG photo. But I want you to think for a minute. David, I know we, we, we almost deified David. But David, there's a lot going on in his life. He's the one that's overlooked. 
out there tending sheep, his own daddy didn't even acknowledge that he had leadership capability when the prophet came to anoint somebody. I got to reading and found out that there is a very strong rabbinical thought that believes that David was the likely, pretty likely chance that he was the Ill illegitimate son of a mother's affair. Which is why he would pen the words, in sin did my mother conceive me. Which may be the reason we see this distancing from his father and even his mother. I don't know, but there's that thought. But we do know that the family seems to view him as not much more than an errand boy delivering cheese and crackers. And then we see this divine providence reach down and lift him up. I told you all this wasn't going to be a comfort sermon. He's chosen and dropped down into Saul's house. And it looks like everything's going to come together. He's, he's now in a place of position. And then he becomes the whipping boy to a narcissistic madman. He has numerous near-death encounters. He, he endures murderous attempts. I guess that's workplace harassment on top of trauma. Then his life just goes from one dramatic event to the next. The crazy part is now he's got all this emotional junk going on the inside of him because he loves the guy that hates him. He has deep respect for this king who's crazy. And now the object of his affection and respect becomes the king that hates him. And so we'll, 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 we'll resolve this and we'll fix it. Marriage, boy, marriage just fixes everything. How many know that? That's a joke. And to make it worse, I don't know what got in his head. He becomes the son-in-law to the crazy man. How's that for Thanksgiving dinner? And then the chick he married mocks his worship. Now, oh, we're just getting started. His daughter is raped by a family member. Then his son leads a coup d'etat against him. Anybody depressed yet? Oh, um, by the way, then he commits adultery. I mean, this is the last person I want to talk to in the office. I mean, you just pick a crisis and he's had it. You, you pick the, the worst event possible and now we're going to add to it post-traumatic stress syndrome all the men lift up their voice and weep until there's no power to weep and they decide to kill him and David is deeply distressed but now let, let me qualify I am, not, I am not diminishing anybody suffering from any kind of trauma in their life. I want to say that clearly. I'm not, I'm not a mental health expert. I'm not a counselor. In this church, in this room today are some very incredible fact. Before I preach this message, I reached out to them to get some help because I wanted to make sure I was, I was, I was okay. Because I believe in mental health help. And there are people that are in this room that suffer from, from some very, very deep struggles because of what they've been through. So don't misunderstand anything I say tonight. I am not in any way belittling or diminishing their issues. But I did get interested recently in how people, some overcome and some struggle. To whatever degree, I pastored a man for a number of years that had been a paratrooper in the Korean War. And after the Korean War, this was into uh, the early 2000s, he was a member of, of our church. And he told me one time, he said, Pastor, he said, I suffer so bad from the memories of that struggle and the issues that I saw. He said, I have not slept one night since the Korean War. And others just seem to bounce back and others carry with them 
And I got interested then to lesser degrees as I pastor people that go through adversity and I see ministries that rebound and others fall flat and can't ever seem to get it back together. People that are resilient and others just can't seem to get through it. And I wanted to know how can I be a better pastor? How can I help people that that go through? Because we're all going to go through things and we're all going to face traumatic events. And and I wanted to do what I could and so I began to research and I became aware reached out to people in my church in the counseling field and I was given some information about a very important figure in our current mental health uh, studies, Dr. Martin Seligman, who is one of the leading uh, mental health experts who discovered what he has labeled along with others, learned helplessness. Would you say that with me? Learned helplessness. I told you it wasn't a conference message. How did they come up with this phrase, learned helplessness? Well, they did testing. That's what smart people do. And they started with the prime candidates, mice, cockroaches, and dogs. Made PETA proud. And they gave these mice and cockroaches and dogs painful shock. And they did not just give it and release it. They gave it continually beyond the control of the mice, roaches, and dogs. Continual without letting up. And these creatures learned to accept the pain. And they made no attempt to escape it. So then they begin to discuss, they researched more, talked and shared the information. Then they decided to take testing to a new level. This time, the theory would be tried upon human beings. They took three different groups of people. The first group, they exposed to very loud, continued, annoying noises. And they put in the room with group number one, they put a button that was not marked, but that button was in front of the group that was hearing this very loud, obnoxious, painful noise. With no instructions, these people figured out, if I push this button the noise will stop. The second group, they put in the same room, but they disengaged the button, and they gave the same painful sound, but no button to stop it. The third group, they took into a room with no button and no noise and just left them there. These three groups were tested on day one. They brought the same three groups back the next day. Same groups, but different scenarios. The same noise was applied to all three groups this time, but all that was changed was all you had to do was wave your hands 12 inches and the noise would stop. Group number one that had had the working button figured out how to stop the noise. Group number three that didn't have any noise and no button figured out how to stop this thing. But group number two from the day before whose button didn't work, they did not even try. Learned helplessness. The experts begin to dive deeper trying to figure out what was the difference in the groups. And they came up with one key word. That word was optimism. Something inside group number one and group number three, something on the inside of them said, this doesn't have to be this way. 
Something inside of them said, I don't know how, but I'm going to figure this out. Something inside of them said, this doesn't have to be forever. Something said, things can change. It don't have to be this way always. And they begin to say, if you can learn helplessness, then there ought to be a way to prove that you can learn optimism. So they said, let's test the theory. So they got some rats. And they put those rats, boy, don't y'all just feel the Holy Ghost right now. They put those rats in a tank. And they filled that tank with water. And those little rats swam for 10 minutes and then just gave up and drowned. They said, that's test number one. They said, let's get some more rats. I don't know if they went to New York City somewhere, but they got rats. They got them and put them in another tank. And they filled the tank up with water. And those little suckers went to swimming. And when they got to about nine and a half minutes, they saw rats looking at each other. And they saw them starting to slow down. So they drained the tank and took the rats out and set them in a dry place for several minutes. And they took those rats that had been pulled out of the water and they put them back in the tank. And fill the water. Boy, don't you feel like that's happening in your life sometimes? They filled the tank up with water, and those rats went to swimming again. But the scientists were amazed to find out that the rats didn't swim for 10 minutes this time. They swam for 18 minutes. Those little rats came to preach to you tonight and tell you if you get a little bit of hope at no limits, you can make it a little bit longer. I don't care how bad it is. If you can just get a few minutes of faith and you can get a few minutes of hope, oh, you can make it a little bit longer. be seated. Out of that study, what is now a $145 million initiative by the U.S. military, it has the acronym PERMA, which was designed to help soldiers suffering from PS PTSD. And PERMA is an acronym that stands for Positive Emotion engagement, relationship, meaning, and accomplishment. And I want to preach from those last few terms on this Sunday night revival. This ain't a conference. Conference is over. It's Sunday night church. Punch your neighbor say, I'm glad to be at church with you today. Everybody say positive emotion. They said positive emotion is required. Because you're going to have to, all of you men and women that are struggling, if you're going to get out of this dilemma you're in, you're going to have to recognize no matter what you've been through, you have value. So Bowling Green State University and West Point Behavioral Science Department, I'm going to give you, I'm not making this up. You can go find it for yourself. They determined if you're going to help people that are struggling with this, they said that you're going to have to help people. They need to build a spiritual core. They describe that spiritual core. I have it in my library. They say you need to connect with something that is bigger than yourself. They said if you're going to get the victory over this, you're going to have to craft a new identity. I 
was amazed as I had that textbook out and I read where they were talking about crafting a new identity. And the question is, what kind of person do you want to be? I'm going to give you a quote. This is straight out of the medical book. One example quote was, you need to take seriously the idea of a hero like a Greek hero who returns from Hades to tell the world how to live. My God, I was in the coffee shop and about had a revival all by myself. They were saying the way you get the victory is you get a new identity by somebody that came out of hell and told the world how to live. My God, the best way to overcome your setback is you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Put your neighbor say you need to have some healthy positive emotion. Psalm 1611, thou wilt show me the path of life in thy presence is fullness of joy and at thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. My God, you've been through a year of hell. You got to get to no limits and remind yourself you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Thy word, Jeremiah 15, thy word was unto me a joy and a rejoicing of my heart. I am called by thy name. What's he saying? I'm a child of God. I don't care what I've been through. I don't care what I'm up against. I'm a child of God. You may be seated, Jesus, in his prayer for his disciples, John chapter 17 and verse 3. There, verse 3, he said, These things, he said, He's praying, He said, These things I speak in the world that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. You need so much Holy Ghost in you. That if the whole world turns against you, the joy's inside yourself. Well, I can't live for God because I'm not married. You need to get God all by yourself. I don't have a husband. I don't care if you lost a husband. Husband, you don't have to lose your joy. Everybody shout engagement. Number one was you got to have positive emotion. They said if you're going to have a spiritual core and come over that trauma, you're going to have to involve engagement in your life. Engagement as in you're in the game. You're take like Brother Smith said, you're doing something. In other words, you're never going to be victorious trying to sit on the bench as an observer. You gotta get engaged. I, I wanted to clarify this, so I called, I called Sister Carissa, I said, Sister Carissa, you gotta help me out. This, this, this is really too good just to read. So she, she directed me, I, I read some more stuff, and, and I, I said, now tell me about this engaged part. She said, if you listen to him speak, talking about Dr. Seligman, she said, you listen to him speak, he will talk about getting in the flow. Is Carissa here tonight? Are you here? Wave a hand at me, Carissa. Where at? Where you at? Am I telling the truth? Just wave your hand. Okay, okay, that's a, that's a smart woman right there. She said, Pastor, you got to focus on that getting in the flow part under engagement. I said, what did that mean? She said, that means you get caught in worship. You've been going through hell. You've been going. You know what you need to do? You need to get on that Sunday night and just get in the flow. Woo! What are you doing? I'm praising my way to victory. I'm, what are you doing? I'm getting in the flow. I'm engaging my faith. I'm engaging my life. I'm getting out of the lowlands. I'm coming up to victory. Let me.
me tell you something. Don't you come to church and watch when you get to the house of God. If you've been going through something, get in the flow. Engage his presence. Get lost in the Holy Ghost. The next time you make that corner, somebody says, what are you doing? Just tell them if I don't do this, I'll lose my mind. I dare you try it right now. Just get in the Holy Ghost and worship a little bit. Just engage the spirit right now. Get in the flow of the Holy Ghost. Come on, there's a renewing in your mind. There's a renewing in your spirit. Ooh, I feel the Holy Ghost. I feel the Holy Ghost. In fact, I ain't, I, ain't, I ain't even preaching the rest. I ain't even preaching the rest of this. God, it's Sunday night. Conferences, you got to finish. But Sunday night, you when the Holy Ghost falls, you just let it fall. R stands for relationship. What I forgot what the other one stands for. Everybody say relationship. Everybody say meaning. Everybody say accomplishment. I'll preach that another time. But let me tell you something. In this thing called the church of the living God, we got the best relationships around. We have relationship with one another, and we got relationship with our heavenly father. And we got meaning like you can't even understand. We're a part of a bigger thing that means more than any. I want the singers come up here. Come on. It's Sunday night church. I told you I didn't bring a conference message. I brought a word of encouragement. I've come for somebody to get delivered. I've come for somebody to get the Holy Ghost. I've come for somebody to be set free. Everybody say A. That stands for accomplishment. In other words, they say you got to get engaged, you got to get positive, you need to build some great relationships, and you need to accomplish some stuff that has some meaning. Perma, everybody say perma. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I can do all things, Brother Cardenas. Through Christ, who strengthens me. Last night, y'all raised your hand that you've had adversity. So are you going to stay in that same condition? Are you going to play victimhood? We are more than... We are more than what? What's a conqueror? How do you become more than a conqueror? I mean, a conqueror, you win, right? That's the whole game, win or lose. Well, what does it mean to be more than a conqueror? Let me tell you what more than a conqueror means. More than a conqueror, let me tell you, conquering, we'll just use example. We'll say you grew up in the poorest part of town with crack houses on every side, with no money in your family, a broken home, addicted parents, everything crazy on your street. But something inside of you says, I'm getting out of here. I'm not staying here. Like J.T. Pugh said, with rain falling on him, barefooted and pants too short, as he cried and screamed, I will not be poor my whole life. I will not be poor. Conquering's when you go to school and you get an education and you get a job and you get out of that place and you find a nice, safe life and you live happily ever after. But more than a conqueror is where not only do you come out, but you say, you know what? I'm going back in. And I'm 
going to buy that little house where I used to live. And I'm going to win my neighborhood. And I'm going to start a drug rehab program. That's more than a conqueror. You're not only coming out of sin, we're going back in to pull out of the fire. Something happens when you call his name. I don't care what adversity you fought. I don't care what mess you're in right now. Tim, you know, I don't even care if it's cancer. You want to see a miracle? Wave your hand, Tim. That's a miracle right now. Healed of cancer. As for me, I've been through hell. I fought all kinds of devils. I faced all kinds of issues. But if you think I'm staying down here, you're a fool, honey. I'm coming out and I'm taking over. I'm going to claim the victory. I'm going to claim my property. If you got an issue or a need, I want you to get as close as you can. I want every preacher in here that can get up on this platform. Singers, get ready. We're going to call on the name of Jesus, and we're going to pray, and we're going to push back against the gates of hell. How many need a healing in your body? Let me see your hand right now. Hold your hand. You need a healing. Come on, hold it up. Hold it up. If somebody's got a hand up by you, get over by them and get ready to pray in faith. Everybody say, pray in faith. Listen to me. We're not going to pray. Boy, I, I wasn't going to do this, but I, it's Sunday night. Everybody say, faith. faith. Remember the lesson of the rats. You're getting a little hope tonight. Swim a little longer. Everybody say, faith. faith. Do not default when we pray in a minute. To the will of God. What do you mean, Brother Young? I have grown up in Pentecost. I am sick of hearing this prayer. God, heal them if it be your will. That is not what your Bible said. Jesus said, when you pray, you pray from heaven's point of view. As it is in heaven, so on earth. The last time I checked, there wasn't no sickness in heaven. The last time I checked, there wasn't no cancer in heaven. The last time I checked, there was no confusion in heaven. What about all them people that didn't get healed? I ain't God. I don't know why. That ain't my job to tell you why they did or didn't get healed. But I will tell you what James said. James said, you're not healed because you're not praying in faith. When you pray, quit defaulting in case you don't get healed. Well, it just must not be the will of God that I get healed. I bind that devil in Jesus' name. As it is in heaven, so on earth. I'll let God deal with the fallout. I'll let God deal with the results. My job is to pray from heaven's point of view. I had Priscilla Magruder right here to tell you about what it looks like from heaven's point of view. In heaven, you're already healed. In heaven, you've already got your end. Are you ready? I want to, Brother Young, you're hyping this up. I don't care what you think I'm doing. If you get mad at this, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want an evangelist at your church. We still believe in healing at no limits. We still believe in end time revival at no limits. We still believe in talking in tongues at no limits. We still believe anything is possible at no limits. 
believe that something happens when we call that name. I said we believe something happens when we call that name. I want you, they're fixing to sing. We're throwing conference. I, I know all the conference protocol that's done. I want you to do whatever you got to get into. If you got to clap, you got to move, you got I don't care. Just you better do something as Bradley Smith would say. But get rid of your doubt. Get rid of your victimization. Get rid of your fear. Quit blaming everybody and say, as of right now, I'm laying hold of a promise. I'm laying hold of a miracle. I'm claiming it. Are you ready? Are you ready? When I count to three, I want you to begin to praise God and speak to your mountain in the